the whole point of this long-winded story is that what could we have done better to make sure that that happened? And I think it's one of these things when you're dealing with, you forget sometimes like how serious this is when you've got such a good relationship with the agent and such a good relationship with your clients and such a good relationship with the other clients, everybody's met. So it becomes this kind of community where it's like, oh, we understand, poor you, you know, we get it. We're not going to, it's not that big of a deal kind of thing. But then when you have this situation, you've got people like, you know, my buyer, like absolutely devastated. Welcome to the Ottawa Real Estate Podcast. Join your hosts, Paul Stevenson, David Warren, and Greg Campbell, as they explore the world of real estate and mortgages. From the heart of Canada's capital to markets nationwide, and even a little beyond, get ready for expert insights and hot topics. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome back to the Ottawa Real Estate Podcast. My name is Paul Stevenson. I'm joined, as always, by Greg Campbell and David Warren. We are live and we are yeah. back uh for anyone tuning in i'm going to lead off by saying this if you're listening right now wherever you're listening or watching make sure to subscribe leave a comment leave a review we read the comments we answer your questions and we're also here for all of your mortgage and real estate related questions so reach out to us our information is in the description gentlemen how are you what's going on i i, I should say only good reviews, comments, whatever. Five star, yeah, five star only. Five star only. Yeah, right. <laughs> What's going on? How you guys been? I feel like I feel like it's been a long week. I feel like the last show seems like an eternity ago. I don't know if that's just me, but yeah, I had to. Will you there? It's it's funny because I had to run. I had an appointment that led to another appointment last week when I left early, which was actually the story I wanted to get into. Does everyone just want me to segue into Let's that? just delve right Let's just delve right in. Let's, Let's just do it. Think of Let's just guy. do it. Who cares about the rest of our lives? Let's talk about real estate. Get into it. So a good friend of mine, you know, helped her get her first house. And this is, I guess, about probably 2017 or whatever. So she's moving, moving out to, to the country with, with her life partner, another friend of mine. Ironically, that just happened. And so they're moving from Orleans to... Spencerville, massive property, lots of potential, 1980s bungalow and the family, great family. It was a very, it became a very intimate deal because there was, you know, I had a great agent on the other end of this and, you know, we had to work, we had to work to, to get it done, but it was just, it was, it was mutual. In the end, we got a very reasonable price for the property. Anyways, parents, their son has addiction issues, moved into the house. And, you know, would live in the basement, would live in a trailer, would live on the land, whatever, him and his wife. And the place was just like a complete, complete disaster, unfortunately. So when we, you know, went to see it, the idea was, well, there's lots of potential in this land. You know, let's figure it out because we see what we can make it. And needs a big renovation, whatever. So anyways, we, we get in, we just start talking back and forth, a bunch of trips out to see it, just to make sure that this is what we wanted to do. They were working with a great broker who I knew, which was helpful as well. And I kind of said to them, I said, look, if I said, you guys shouldn't buy this unless you have at least a hundred thousand available immediately to make this what you want to make it. Right. So anyways, they asked for it and they got it right away. That was great. That was one thing, you know, deal goes on. Strong negotiation. We get a fair price for it. Inspection miraculously passed better than anyone thought it would, which was great. So now it's kind of like, and now we had to sell her house because we didn't want to put a first refusal on it. It wouldn't take a first refusal. So we had that. So, you know, we ended up dropping the price when it wouldn't sell. We got it sold. I got it done. We moved up the closing date. Now we moved up the closing date, which only gave them about two weeks to pack up everything in the house. This is the point that I'm getting to. This is the purpose of the conversation. I had to preface it with, you know, story, the story so far. Yeah. The story. Mm. What the story, right? The real estate stories. People like stories. So we move it up. There's a couple weeks. We're like, 
okay, can you guys do this? Yeah, we can make it happen. All right. And then, you know, the day comes for our walkthrough. For those that don't know, in most real estate transactions in, the, in your agreement of purchase and sale, you'll request a final walkthrough before closing so that you can just walk through the property, make sure that everything is as is within a few days before, make some notes, maybe take some measurements, decor ideas, whatever. So we book our walkthrough. They confirm it. Now, throughout the process, everything that they confirmed, they were there other than one showing. The, the owners were always at the house, which is very, which is kind of unheard of. Like you don't usually do that. They were there. We just said no problem. There for inspection, there for whatever. So they, we see the, we see the, excuse me, the walkthrough accepted. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe the agent would, you know, let them know since this is the walkthrough just to not be at the house. And foolishly, I didn't make the call to request that they're not there for the, for the final walkthrough. So my clients get there just before me and there's like two moving trucks. There's like 10 people in the yard. Oh my God. In the house. So I call him, I'm on my way there. So I call him and I'm like, listen, what's up? And he's like, oh man, he's like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you didn't mention anything. He's like, no, no, I didn't. So we both kind of like, okay, let's just, we'll figure this out. Obviously. So he calls them, says like, you know, and they're kind of worried that we're going to walk through it because it's all in shambles boxes. And like the sun's got this squad of guys taking stuff out the back in and out. There's a big bin and the, the, my clients are going to see something that they don't like whatever. That's not, it's not the case. So anyways, we kind of say like, look, you guys can stay, just give us the house for 30 minutes. That's all we ask. So anyways, I get there, I get more of the story of what's happening and all this. So the family's moving out the front door, the son's moving out the basement, the back door with his crew. And you remember what I said earlier about the, the son and, and his wife and everything, right? So it, that's all going on. Now we walk through, everything's great. I'm like, this is perfect. So two days closing, but we're all sitting there going, is all of this shit really going to be out of the house in two days? Hmm. So I'm thinking it's possible. It's possible that this can all be gone in two days. I've seen much worse. They already had a lot of the junk removed. They already packed a bin. It was gone. So anyways, the two days comes, closing comes, you know, even the sellers there, I'm talking to them. They're like, you know, on closing, what's the word? I go, well, usually we'll get the keys, you know, somewhere between 12 and four o'clock or get permission to come and, you know, access the lockbox to get the keys to get into that property. So that time comes, I say to them, I say, guys, just show up on Saturday. Don't show up on Friday. There's a chance that someone's still going to be on the property on Friday. You know, <laughs> and I say, it's not going to be the owners. It's not going to be the parents. The other people will be on the property in their trailer or something. If you come on Friday, maybe. So one Scott goes by on, on, on Friday and, and they're there. Speaks with them. Yeah, we're going to be gone. Okay. We're going to be gone. Great. Goes back Saturday morning, still there. Oh yeah. My car broke down and the truck that was supposed to come and pull the trailer didn't come. So we're like, okay. So I say, sorry, it was Thursday. This was Friday. And so anyways, I messaged the lawyer. This is what's going on. Okay. Thank you. Keep us in the loop, whatever. So next day comes, go back. Still there. Trailer's plugged into the house, <laughs> you know? Still moving, ask it, you know, asking if they can use the washroom in the house. Uh, uh, little, no little, little things. So we're kind of like, okay. And, you know, at that point, I'm like, look, go back Saturday. If they're still there, you know, call the police. Just let them know what's going on. And everything. Anyways, short story long, I guess. That's what I'm getting to here. Police come. Not much they can do, you know, in we kind of came up with the best solution. Worst case would be that we the, or the current new owners hire a tow truck to come and take the trailer to where they're going and then we rebuild the family after the fact right so we were like okay well that's that's an idea if we need to do that anyways he says that he has there's other people coming today to help him the car is going to become the car is going to be gone trucks coming to tow so anyways two and a half days later after they close it's gone and now they can go in and they can do their work but the whole point of this long-winded story is that what could we have done better to make sure that that happened? And I think it's one of these things when you're dealing with, you forget sometimes like how serious this is when 
you've got such a good relationship with the agent and such a good relationship with your clients and such a good relationship with the other clients. Everybody's met. So it becomes this kind of community where it's like, oh, we understand, poor you, you know, we get it. We're not going to, it's not that big of a deal kind of thing. But then when you have this situation, you've got people like, you know, my buyer, like absolutely devastated, like losing, losing her shit emotionally. And like, just mentally, it's it completely exhausting because it's like, why the f are these people still in my house on my property? You know, thank God, you know, she has a partner who is very calm and can handle that kind of stuff, like, as well as me, right? So the, there's the benefit of having that type of attitude towards it. But you need to be really on point. Like, I will never let anything like this happen again. I would be, I have a list of things already that I've written down that I would be putting into place saying like, no, there's not a chance that anyone is going to be staying on this property. And we're going to make sure of it that if like, if anyone is there, you know, two hours after this thing, then there's going to be a fine or some shit like that. You know what I mean? Like the lawyers are going to get serious with it because you're buying a house. You want your keys. You want to get into your house. You don't want anyone else there on your land at that mm -hmm. point. But the emotion of everyone coming together, it's, it's a mistake. And people forget that. That's why we have agents. And that's why when you do deals and you have two families coming together, you don't really want to get to know the other family because it can cause problems. Yeah, that's the, thank you, Greg. Let's get into the mood boost. No, that's, that's the human element. That's the human element of, of real estate is that there is two real people on either side of the transaction. Like you said, Greg, having professionals dealing with that middle ground is of utmost importance because it, in most cases, takes away that gray area where it is black and white. And sometimes it might feel impersonal, but that's kind of what you want in those transactions. Like if you're dealing, mm -hmm. if your client was dealing directly with those sellers, would have been a nightmare. It would have been, a, well, it wasn't, it would have been more of a Exactly. You know? Yeah. So are you and thinking, and, and to be fair, and sorry, Paul, but to be fair, like the sellers, they felt badly about, you know, along the way, they knew that it could go a certain way. They were great. Everybody was so great. And we didn't even tell them like the agent, I, the agent, when I called the agent and told him what was going on, I, he's like, dude, he's like, they're on their way out. Of I'm like, I'm like, don't even call them, man. I'm like, don't even let them know that this is happening. I go, they're moving to their new life. I'm like, just leave it alone. I'm like, I'll let you know when it's finished. But so could you put something in the agreement that states like any property left on site? Yeah, is and the so, owner, is the owner's property now or something? And so like that? yeah, and, and sorry that that was that was the last element. So when they got in, there was still things in the basement, and there's still stuff on the property. So I brought out my buddy Corey D, who owns Junk That Funk, and his crew. They came out on Monday and they took everything out, and then the you know the sellers are getting billed for it through the lawyers. So there's an interesting in the in New Brunswick. They have a a condition in order to fund on a like on closing day that the buyers are doing a walkthrough the morning of closing. Yeah, I remember so the transaction doesn't actually close and they and the realtor going through the property, the buying realtor and client or buyers, they only they only fund and only close on that when they've advised the lawyer, their lawyer that yes, everything's out and it's in should be a thing. everything's in working order as we expected, all the appliances are working, the AC's working or the furnace or all this because exactly as you said, like when this comes up of stuff being there, I bought properties where stuff has just been left behind, you know, for for me as the buyer and and people don't or or clients where they move in and now suddenly appliances don't work or an AC unit and they're having to like go back and like you said, try to retroactively go after the the sellers for reimbursement. Yeah. When there's no hold back, that becomes a little bit of an issue. So I think maybe kind of instituting that same kind of condition or methodology that they have in New Brunswick, I think would be helpful for a lot it of people. It should totally be a thing here, 100%. Just oh, like how the finances oh, is in Quebec should be in mm -hmm. Ontario as well, right? <clears throat> Where your deal is not firm until the financing, until everything is done, all conditions in the mortgage are removed. Are satisfied. Satisfied, yeah. yes. Thank you. Yeah. If only, if only each province could talk to one another and there was boards <laughs> that could maybe meet amongst these very few provinces right. to see right. what their transaction is like and, huh. I would bring both, both of those rules to Ontario <clears throat> would be a huge, solve many problems. Yeah. Well, a few more, a few more of those sorts of stories and, and 
that sort of thing will happen. Are you thinking of buying or selling a residential property? Relationships are at the heart of every real estate transaction. At Geltain Poirier Avocat Lawyers, we love to bring residential buyers, sellers, agents, lenders, mortgage brokers, and the law together to close the deal for you. For an effortless client experience that opens doors, call us at 613-744-4488 or visit our website at geltainpoirierlaw.ca. Let's get to the heart of your deal. Are you trying to grow your mortgage business? Centum has the tools and support to help you take your business to the next level. Get access to everything from free unlimited custom marketing to daily direct pay. Find out what your business can do with Centum. Learn more at joincentum.ca. Your home is one of your biggest investments, and the team at Big Westboro can help you protect it. Our expert brokers will find the perfect coverage to keep your home and belongings safe. Call 613-239-5792 or visit thebig.ca slash Westboro for a free quote. Think big. Protect what matters most. So, so we get into the news, gentlemen. Change, change gears a bit. Change gears in the news. Let's do it. So I have one, one article today regarding CMHC. So CMHC reports annual pace of housing starts up 8% in October. So to summarize, it says in October 2024, the CMHC reported an 8% increase in the annual pace of housing starts, reaching 240,000 units, up from 223,000 in September. This growth was driven by a 6% rise in urban housing starts, totaling 223,000 units. With urban areas, multi-unit starts, including apartments, condos, townhouses, etc., increased by 7%. Let's see, CMHC's chief economist, Bug, well, well, Bug, Bob Duggan, noted that despite higher activity in the prairies, Quebec, and Atlantic provinces, Ontario and BC experienced declines. He emphasized that current levels remain insufficient to restore affordability in Canada's urban centres. Year-to-date figures from January to October 2024 show a 12% increase in housing starts in Montreal compared to the same period last year. Conversely, Vancouver and Toronto experienced declines of 18 and 20%, 21% respectively. The six-month moving average of the annual rate of housing starts remains stable at 243,000 units in October. TD economist Rishi Sondi described October's housing starts as healthy, in quotes, suggesting a positive contribution to economic growth in the fourth quarter. However, he cautioned that the overall outlook remains soft, in quotes, particularly due to significant weaknesses anticipated in Ontario, where housing starts have declined to levels last seen in 2020. Who needs housing, right, guys? I mean, we, we don't need units. Let's just keep delaying things. What was the number they wanted for this year? It was like a million starts or something. Wasn't it crazy? Something crazy like that? I don't remember what the number was. I, I don't even pay attention to it anymore because it's all nonsense. 100 million homes yeah. built in the next 10 years. I'm just <laughs> like, I, 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 I see, I read it and then I hear it and I'm like, I, that's not even a thing. I don't even, I'm not even paying attention to that. But it's, it, the thing is, it's housing starts and not necessarily not for finished. purchase. Not well, not finishes, but then also not necessarily for resale. For per, yeah, this is including right. rentals, and most and rental being buildings. built right now are converting to rentals. If you look around Ottawa at the mm-hmm. buildings that are being built um, yeah. for condos, are they're, they're rentals. Canada has an obsession with home ownership. North America has an obsession with home ownership. How is that going to affect, and how is that going to impact, or? you know, housing prices, if you're only focused for CMHC, they're giving money away for rentals, for purpose-built rentals, and that's why everyone moved to it. You know, how is that, you know, as this time goes on of, of these programs, how is that, you know, how are prices going to be kind of level out? How are they going to come down either or become more affordable? Yes, we can have housing starts, but they need to be also focused on resale. I think it yeah. kind of like I think I wish they se- I wish they segmented out those numbers as far yeah. as like what's rentals and what's what's actual resale because I think it's a lot of smoke and mirrors in those in those classic hmm. yeah classic media off again <laughs> came out this morning Dave I know you want yeah to they came out we're Tuesday the nineteenth they just came out just before we started recording at two percent for October analysts were expecting one point nine percent so it was just a slight increase of what the expectation was but right in right in line you know really this it, I mean it's like the first uptick since June but it's obviously minor and this is it takes time for any of these kind of rate decreases by the Bank of Canada to ripple through the economy typically takes anywhere from nine months to 
a year and a half for it to ripple through. So we've had a decrease of 125 basis points or 1.25% over the last four Bank of Canada decisions, but those haven't been like that decrease in people's mortgages or lines of credit, you know, haven't, that, that hasn't been felt in the economy yet. So we'll see kind of how that, as we continue going forward, how that really affects things. But there is now with that uptick, Reuters was reporting that there is now a uh, 60% chance of a quarter basis point cut on the uh, December 11th announcement. So it's, I think there still will be a decrease. I know, you know, whether it's a quarter point or half point, it's certainly expected that it's going to be, that there will be a decrease in, in December, but, you know, I guess we'll see what more numbers come out of whether that increases to a half point. And apparently I'm losing my voice right now. Hold on. All right. Boom. Packing those darts, David. It's wow. <laughs> I thought I muted myself there, but apparently nope. I did not. No. Nope. <laughs> Leave that in. Compress it. Make sure it's very present. Mix. Oh my God. I'm done talking for now and I'm signing off. Perfect. On to the mood boost. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I got a few more things. So a couple couple changes coming down the pipe. Uh, you're talking about the Bank of Canada's rate announcement. So a few changes coming out in the coming months. So I wanted to just kind of summarize those for everyone listening. So the first one, which is actually happening this week, is November 21st, the removal of the stress test for mortgage renewals. So this is the stress test is no longer going to be required for switching lenders of renewal. This is uh, this applies for loan amounts and amortization periods remaining the same. So currently it was available for insured mortgages. Now this is going to be available for all mortgages. So we talked about this probably maybe three to six months ago. ago. Yeah. So as of November 21st, which will be tomorrow when this comes out, this will basically help increase competition. So anyone who has a mortgage with, you know, 50% loan to value left or even less, really any amount now at this point, you no longer have to qualify using the stress test. Meaning at a high level, if you were to transfer from one lender to another, previously you would have to qualify at the rate you're going to get plus 2%, which is how we qualify you when you're purchasing a home. However, now on renewals, you no longer have to do that. So you can qualify at the contract rate, which will open up doors for you. And in my opinion, I just think it means that the the current lender that you're with is going to have to kind of sharpen their pencil a bit and they won't be able to kind of hold your ransom. You know, <laughs> you'll, you'll have more more options and, and more ability to transfer, which I think is good from a competitive competition standpoint for consumers. So that's a very good thing. Also, the next one is with regards to extended amortizations for first-time home buyers. So this, I think, will actually impact the market more than anything, especially leading into the spring. So as of August, first-time home buyers were eligible for 30-year amortizations on new builds, new constructions. But as of December 15th, that expands to all first-time home buyers and mm. new builds, regardless of down payments. So it doesn't matter, you know, whether you're buying a new build or not or resale you will be eligible for that 30 amortization, which will increase el- uh, increase affordability for first time home buyers. And in my opinion, will very likely drive up prices, even if it's slight, just because people are going to qualify for more, which is going to, you know, inevitably drive prices up. So that one's very interesting. I had a case study for that. I don't think we really need to get into it, but if anyone's interested, it's basically for someone who previously qualified at 400,000, it'll basically increase it up to 450. So just as kind of a general, you know, I have Dora here as a, as a case study. So using a, an average of today's rates, it would add about 50,000 to her affordability and that would increase her monthly payment by about $48. So, you know, very nominal as far as an increase. Now, obviously important to keep in mind, if you take a 30 year amortization over 25, the amount of interest you're paying, you know, is, is, a lot more. I think it was like, I think it's like 30 to 40% more over the total ter- total amortization by taking that 30 years. So it does come at a cost, but it does allow you to get into a higher price point. Dave and I, I mean, every single time you pre-approve a client for 400,000, they find their dream home at 450 or 500, it's 550 <laughs> or five, you know, 600, 650. So they always want that a little bit more. So mm-hmm. hopefully this will at least, you know, satisfy that hunger, you know, for that little bit I- more. I think the biggest is just in, you know, especially for a first time home buyer, I think if you can leave your purchase price at a 25 year AM, as if you're getting just a 25 year amortization, maybe using that 30 year to help with your monthly cash flow to decrease that in the here and now while, you know, 
inflation is still obviously it's coming down, but still impacting people, but taking that account and, and to your point though, of the, of the cost of that 30 year, there is a slight increase as well to the, to the mortgage default insurance premium. So yeah. it's, there's a 0.2% in difference. So a 25 year amortization, let's say uh, 5% down is 4% is of the loan amount is the mortgage default insurance premium. If you're taking a 30 year, it would be 4.2%. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're talking about, you know, big loan amounts, that does thousands. have an impact. Yeah. Are there anyone offering, is there any lender offering a 30 year amortization product for one year? Like a one year term? Yeah. You, you can. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the amortization would be like the full, just the total length of the mortgage, which dictates the payment. But then the term itself, you could take a one year term and then in a year renew for five or three or what have you, right? Yeah, you term. could renew, but couldn't you, could you renew, you could renew after one year at 30 for like five or 25, couldn't you? Well, yeah, I mean, there we go. Yeah, you could, yeah, go ahead, Dave. No, no, it's okay. Yes, you can, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> I was sorry, I was looking up rates to kind of compare pretty well, you know, if looking at a one year fixed, you're between 609 to 744 on a one year. So you really have to. There, that's okay, and that was the question. So our. So you're, yeah. If you want to lock in what for, you know, what a lot of people and and what I have conversations with clients about is looking at taking an adjustable rate mortgage, which is you know we've talked about it before. So I'm not getting into the differences between variable and and adjustable, but take an adjustable rate mortgage. You're going to be in and around the you know prime minus 0 0.8, prime minus 0 0.85 percent, which right now would leave you around 5.15. As rates decrease, so let's say December, it comes down a quarter point, you know, now you're going to be at 495, but you can convert those to a fixed at any time. So if you're wanting to time the market from locking in on a rate, take an adjustable rate mortgage, your payment will decrease as prime comes down as well, but you could convert that to a fixed rate at any point without any penalties. So, you know, for those that are unsure of whether to take a one, two, three year, but obviously the one and two years are very much premium versus the three, a year or five year fix. Look at maybe taking that variable, like have that discussion with, with your mortgage professional and, and use that strategy to kind of help you time that market. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. The one year is, I mean, that's 7%. I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't make sense in any capacity. The math doesn't math. It doesn't math. No, not on the rates that high. I just keep, you know, it's the idea of, you know, sometimes people will get a private at a higher rate for a year just to get going and then they get their shit. Yeah, but even even a private one year is like six nine nine to you know, six nine nine to eight nine nine right now. So I mean you you the one that are on the one that I'm doing right now is ten nine nine. Yeah. So I mean it, they are all dependent on you know, the an individual is going with a private lender for a reason. You know, a lot what? of cases they aren't qualifying, maybe they don't have income, their credit is in shambles and they're needing to rebuild it. You know, somebody doesn't voluntarily go with a private for a reason and, and the and the rates differ. So what Paul's talking about is kind of that best case scenario of rate. Best case of, you know, that you're in that yeah, best case, you know, C, I guess. And then yeah, and they go up. I mean, you can get privates in the fifteen percent range, just depending mm -hmm. on again where the location is, the loan to value, you know, that overall profile of the client. But if it is something where you have that roadmap, absolutely get started. It could be a solution that gets you in that home now while, you know, while you're rebuilding credit, while you're maybe between jobs, while you're this, while you're that, and then refinance out at the end of that year into a better situation. The same idea with a B lender, you know, you go with a, a B lender, which might be in the, the high fives right now, but with that roadmap of in a year or two, these are the steps taken to rebuild your credit or pay down this debt or, you know, between jobs, or then you have a self-employed history. Well, now you can move over to... Uh, VA side. So having that roadmap, but I, I would never advise, and I never advise anyone taking either a, an alternative lender or a private lender to not have that roadmap set out. You have to um, have it set up for sure. Otherwise they're set it up. They're set up for, for foreclosure. Otherwise, if they have yes. no roadmap, they're set up to invest that money on the down payment and they're going to lose that home, ruin their credit and, and lose all their money. The they're only paying it. It's interest only. Like they're not going to get ahead. The one that we're doing right now is due to a client who has, does very well, has multiple income properties, has multiple businesses, but is not organized. 
So mm-hmm. when it came down, we got, got a good rate approved for well over a million, got a great property based on, you know, as you know, the lender conditions. And when we got deep into it, like the list was massive and she didn't really know what she was getting into. And so mm-hmm. I was more, I think I might've spoken about this a bit before I got very involved with helping organize all this stuff. And we got in the end, we got a decline, so couldn't close. And then we were, she was putting it on like deposits, unrefundable deposits just to keep it going. Right. Anyways, we had to, after 30 days, we had to pull out, started again with a new lender, kind of thought that it would be a little bit different, almost got to the end, but all these new things started coming up from, from this lender and all these things like that she didn't know, like that were on her credit. No idea. And I was helping her resolve some of that. And so we got to the point again now where it was like, oh yeah, we're good. These are the last items that the lender needs. And all of a sudden, boom, new list, new list. And she was losing it. She's like, I'm, I have to go to the hospital. Like I can't, I can't handle the stress anymore. Like if I have to lose it, she's like, just find a way to get me the house, like whatever I need to do. And it's not like she doesn't have the money for it. Right. So anyways, we sorted it out. And she's going private for one year and then mm-hmm. organizing her, her business and getting a bookkeeper, her, getting a bookkeeper and an accountant and uh, getting to work. It, we're going to do it in the right way. So that by the time the year is done, it's like, it's instant and she can just get it. Yeah. She can get a better rate. She can put down more money if she wants to, whatever to bring it down. But it's, it's, it's good. I think for business owner, like she's a very successful business owner that's unorganized and mm-hmm. now You know, we both agree that at the end of this, she understands what she needs to do to be better organized and that she should be better organized for the future. So there's a good lesson. And fortunately, the house is still on the market and we've just, we've just negotiated. We're just waiting on something and it should be closing in 10 days. So thankfully she is not out a ton of cash. Yeah. I have a, I have a situation that I just closed yesterday, client going through a separation. I'll keep it very high level again. Going through separation, quick closing, quick in the sense of like a month and a half, which, you know, up front was going to be a time barrier just because of all the moving parts. Wasn't able to get the separation agreement in place prior to closing. So ended up having to go with a private, basically, short term so that they could get all that sorted. And then we'll get it back over to the A side in the next couple months. But on that short term, again, 699. You know, like a, like a reasonable rate for a show. That's not bad ocean. And then, you know, in three to six months, get everything cleaned up, get it transferred over. A couple other things quickly. So other changes, December 15th, again. So same as the extended amortizations. There's also an increased cap for insured mortgages. So currently the cap is a million. December 15th, going up to 1.5 million. So it's going to allow more buyers to qualify with less than 20% down, which aligns with current market values. I think this is more for kind of the Toronto, Vancouver area, but Ottawa prices, we are seeing, you know, there, there's a lot of homes upwards of a million dollars now. So, you know, this is very relevant in today's markets. And then the last one, January 15th, which we'll talk about more leading up to it, because it is going to be, I think, a very, very well used product, refinancing options for adding secondary suites. So this is only, this is only announced in the last couple of weeks. But homeowners can refinance up to 90% of their property value to add secondary suites. So it supports adding rental units, increasing increasing the housing supply, and the maximum property value is going to be two million. So upwards, you could have a loan upwards of 1.8 million on a refinance, and that's taking effect as of January 15th. This is for and to clarify, this is for insured. Like this is an insured yes, product. Insured, so there will be, see, there will be insure premiums added on that as well to what the difference on those premiums are have not, has not been released, but yeah, as we get more details on that, we'll be able to the, share. The government them. threw the cart before the horse there, eh? They're like, all right, we're doing this and nobody mm-hmm. knows what, what the rates are going to yeah. be or how it's going to impact things, but let's, let's announce it anyways. So yeah, we're waiting. Everyone keeps asking me how we're waiting. We're waiting on more information. Um, keep listening to Torp and we'll keep you informed. Uh, yeah, you find out. Exactly. Exactly. What else, Greg? You had some Orleans numbers, maybe? You want to touch I on real quick? quick? I got some quick numbers here. This is a very, mm, I, don't, I don't want to say vague overview because it's a, it's a professional overview. It's exactly what it is. It's not vague in any way. <laughs> it's a blanketed, it's all properties. So in the last four weeks, 
This is very interesting, I think, well, to anyone. There's right now, there's 319 active listings in Orleans, and that's all the way, you know, rentals, one bedroom condos, all the way up to like multi million dollar properties, like seven bedrooms. The top one is $3.2 million. So that's 319, 70 rentals available. 70 rentals available in Orleans right now. There was 36 rented. And on average, again, this is between low level to high level, 2,700 is the average with 19 days on market. Now, clearly the ones that were lesser or maybe reduced the price are the ones that were, you know, renting in less time because we have up to 82 days on market for rentals even as the max. Sold 149 homes in the last four weeks with an average of 35 days on market. Again, very steady. Right now, there's 32 conditional sales in New Orleans, all the way from 260000 up to a million dollars, which is a big six bedroom, four bath that's been on for 192 days. But the average, and the average is 51 days for those that have conditionally sold. We had 13 expired listings. I thought I had, oh, I had to cancel this too. This is very interesting here. We, 98 listings canceled in the last four weeks. Now, if I look into that further, I'm going to imagine that most of those, were relisted, but I have a feeling that at least half of those are off the market and waiting until spring to return to market. Now, there's something that I want to say. I was speaking with two sellers over the last week, and I believe one of them is moving forward with us. The We had the conversation of listing now versus listing in the spring, and they're very reasonable and with understanding the market and the way that I presented it to them, like, you know, I gave them three prices. They were inclined to list lower because there's so much competition right now in their neighborhood that it doesn't make sense to, to do anything different or to wait. Cause they, I said to them, I said, look, you guys could be waiting to spring. And honestly, in this particular area, I think that you're not going to be able to sell for anything more than you're going to sell for now. Mm -hmm. So they're going ahead. The other group are going to wait till spring, but I'm, I'm of the mind that anything right now, it's the same price that you're going to see in March, at least in March, maybe after it'll change a bit, but with the buyers, even with these incentives and the government trying to kickstart the market, I think buyers are being very smart, regardless of all these extra incentives. And I think they should be. So if, if you're a seller, just be, be aware of that and price accordingly. That's all good advice. Thank you. Great advice. Good advice. Good advice Sound advice, right? Sound advice. Sound advice. Mood seems like I wasn't. Seems like Moods I wasn't pumping the market there, right? <laughs> no, you deflated the market. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> Greg's on the deflationary scale now. Okay, I got three today. Well, uh, eventually I'll come with four, but I have three today. Uh, number one: What do computers eat for a snack? Microchips. Oh, yes. Number two, what superhero has a bad sense of direction? Wonder Woman. I like uh, that one. Wonder Woman. Uh, and number three, last but not least, I just got a promotion at the farm. I'm now the C-I-E-I-O. Oh, yeah. C-I-E-I-O you later. <laughs> exactly. And that is it for this week, gentlemen. So thank you to everyone tuning in. Thank you to our sponsors, as always. And we will be back next week, Wednesday, 10 a.m. Tune in. Thank Creeping you. up on episode 200. Coming up soon. Two Here's weeks. Salt. Have a great week, everyone. Stay safe.